Hello everyone, welcome again to Archaeology 3013, Experimenting with Archaeology. As per custom, we acknowledge the country on which we stand, the Noongar Wadchuk country we stand, and we acknowledge and honour the ancestors past, present and future. Today, in this last lecture in the series, we move on to Digital Heritage Futures. Uh, it's a grand sounding title, but we have to figure out what this means. So archaeology has moved a long way from simply going a bunch of old men, wealthy old men, going out, digging up antiquities and showing them in their cabinets of curiosity. We have a huge process involved in finding sites, in excavating sites, in analysing artefacts, cultural landscapes and so on, and then making these known. And it's particularly here in the latter, making known of what we find, that digital futures become very important. But as behooves us, as critical thinkers, we have to think through carefully what are the issues around digital heritage futures. Indeed, what are, what is digital heritage? Before starting on that, we just need to recap on last week. So last week was the first part of the last part of the three-stage process, the before, during, and after of archaeological and heritage project management. So in terms of analysis, curation, and pseudo-archaeology, the most important thing I've just covered the fact that we deal with a process. No one part of the process is more important than another part. They all operate in tandem and impact on each other. How we analyse what we find, well, there, there's a galaxy of different ways of finding things and they're changing and being added to every day. So it's a really exciting time to be in archaeology. There are all sorts of neat toys that we can use to find out more about the past and how people lived, thought, what inspired them, why groups became extinct, others didn't, all of those kinds of things. Curation is a very broad term that is our care toward, covers our care towards artefacts. How do we look after all these artefacts under our care so that both our research benefits but also generations after us who will have still new questions and still new techniques can also benefit from work done today because of, for example, excavation or collection from the field means that that site is effectively destroyed or disturbed. It'll never exist in that um, format again, people have to go back to our records, for example. And then there's pseudo-archaeology, which in itself is a pretty crazy field, but it's popular, it attracts a lot of people, and it's important that we know A, how to recognise it, B, how to point out the flaws. Um, sometimes they're not, they're not intentional, but many times they're mendacious, i.e. people are seeking to misrepresent or to lie, so we have to point out those. And then finally, we have to show the publics we serve out there what reputable knowledge is and how we interpret sites in more reputable ways. Alrighty, for today, in terms of digital heritage futures, simple definitional stuff to begin off uh, with. What do we mean by digital and heritage? A little bit of a discussion on ethics and drawbacks, although these are embedded in the three case studies we have. And then um, the section on how archaeology is used, the digital, is covered particularly in our three case studies. They're, they're by and large the same thing. Our case studies are the uh, Triumphal Arch at Palmyra, uh, the Beacon Virtua pro Project on Beacon Island of Western Australia, and the antiquities trade, legal and illegal, and um, digital structures and dissemination portals like eBay. All pretty interesting stuff. All of these and many other topics could make up a whole unit, a whole field of study on their own. This is very much touching the tip of the iceberg, but it's a very interesting iceberg. Okay, so what do we mean by digital? In certain ways, digital is a meaningless phrase. When you type up a Word document, or heaven forbid, a Mac document, where you take a photograph, these are already digital. Um, they're manipulations of some sort of code. Digital photographs are manipulations of light and code, for example. And then we go through things like total stations, how we transfer data from these to reconstruct 3D models, all of those kinds of things. So technically, everything really is digital. Even our field notebooks, we tend to scan and photograph those. So by saying you're doing digital archaeology is not particularly helpful. That's taken as a given that a large percentage of what you do will be digital. But what kinds of digital are you doing? Are they appropriate to the project that you've chosen? Um, do they work? Are you aware of their limitations? All of those kinds of things. Are they practical? Um, as it states in this slide, so the digital really is just one of the very many forms that original artifact or site, cultural landscape can exist. 
um, it can be very useful, the digital. And here are just um, five, uh, five ways in which it can be useful. There are many more. So very often it saves time. If we go back a slide, this total station is an electronic form of the old dumpy level, the, the old plane table theodolite. So all it's doing is the measurements on the plane table that you would note by hand on a, on an, in a notebook and on, on your map, and then later, for example, put into a computer and use a program maybe like ArcGIS to construct a map. This one immediately gets those measurements into digital form, which you then upload into the appropriate computer software, and then with some manipulation, sometimes more, sometimes less, produces a map often in a fraction of the time it takes to produce a map in the old analog way, and it can also produce very often maps with multiple layers that fit with GIS and so forth. So it's a time saver. It's also important for standardization. Um, so it standardizes our data so that archaeologists in different countries between different projects can talk to each other. And some of this is really simple. Um, museum collection databases, electronic databases, when people started setting them up, they said, well, there are a lot of different words that people use for the same thing. And the example I have here is, so do you call a chunk of a pot, a broken pot, do you call that pottery or do you call it a ceramic? If you put one or the other in a search field and only that one, you will then not find, if you're searching for ceramics, you will not find all the entries made under pottery. So um, you bring those two entries together and or you decide on a standard term that helps you find as much data as possible. The digital is also able to manipulate data and present it in different ways, 3D models, virtual reality, um, GIS layers, that enable researchers to see the data and to perceive the data in different ways, ways that generate new ideas, ways that test old ideas. So it's very useful for those kinds of things. In the same way that we visualize, for example, artifacts, rock art, stone tools and things, that technology is a very powerful tool for the public out there also to access archaeology. Most archaeological sites, or many archaeological sites, are not close to cities. Cities themselves generally have a rich archaeology. But most archaeology is away from the cities. So most people don't have the time, the money, or the resources to travel out there to visit that archaeology. Traditionally, people have done things like gone to museums, where chunks of archaeology from elsewhere are displayed for the benefit of a metropole audience. But what the digital tells, uh, enables us to do is it enables us to put those objects in lots of different forms and transport them all over the world in all sorts of different forms, such that it doesn't really matter if you're in remote areas, provided you have a good internet connection, um, or, or whether you're in the city areas. And it can often show artifacts that to some people might look a bit dry and dusty in sort of sexier, more virtual kinds of ways. Another way the digital helps us is uh, collection security. It helps us to monitor and track artifacts, almost like one of those CSI crime scene dramas. We're able to document and track all of the different stages of discovery, analysis, curation, loans, etc., of an object. And we can very quickly trace when something untoward happens, um, if there's a theft, if there's damage, if there's a curation intervention, if there's a request for a loan, if there's a request for new research, and all of those kinds of things are very easily handled by the digital. So lots of positive uses. This is a quick note on heritage. Um, there are whole courses on heritage. Like with the term digital, the term heritage is not particularly useful. The term heritage derives from the term inherit. So at its base level, it means everything left to us by the people who came before us. Everything. When you go to museums, for example, or you go to archaeological collections, not everything is curated or collected. So the example over here shows McDonald's. Um, Think what you will of McDonald's. Um, they're an important part of the world, world's culture, at least certain parts of the world's culture. They have material culture, which is interesting. Look at these early McDonald's wrappers over here on the left, and these more contemporary ones um, 60 years later. Are these being collected? These are part of our heritage, but many people would say these are not an important part or not a collection-worthy part. So in practice, what we do is we make a series of decisions, either active or passive, about what we do conserve and study and promote and what we don't. So just be aware of that. How many collections collect plastics, for example? Plastics are really important, and I think we should be collecting them. Um, so heritage 
always in a study needs to be defined, just as digital needs to be defined for the purposes of that project, so that people are clear on what you mean by heritage or digital. Everyone in their head has got some sort of idea of what the digital is and what heritage is. But by and large, two people coming together will not have the same ideas of digital and heritage. So communication has to happen about what we mean by digital, what we mean by heritage. And another thing is a note on ethics. The digital heritage future world is a fascinating world. It's also a minefield where there are a whole set of new issues that arise. These are legal issues, legal in both the Western, indigenous and customary senses. They're intellectual property issues. An actual artifact might be owned by someone, but digital reproductions of it might be owned by other people. And what do we mean by ownership? Do we mean an individual? Do we mean collective ownership? Um, interesting issues. There are attendant ethical, social, political, aesthetic, all sorts of other um, issues. Each case study brings up its own set of issues and we need to think these through so that we're aware of these issues and we do responsible archaeology. What I've got on this slide is a case of the Wanjana. So most people will probably have seen reproductions, copies, photographs or whatever of this wonderful form of rock art. It's an indigenous Aboriginal form of rock art in northern Australia in the Kimberley that has these Wanjana figures painted without a mouth. The Wanjana is difficult to define even by indigenous people because it's such a powerful being. So in an indigenous perspective these are not paintings of something else. This is the actual Wanjana resting on the rock in many cases. It's a powerful being that um, renews the earth, has links to, to rain and weather, is involved in a whole lot of narratives about people's origins and various cataclysmic and other important events that happened on the earth's surface uh, in an Aboriginal understanding. It's, it's a very photogenic image. By the way, pseudo-archaeologists use this image as um, evidence of spacemen and spacewomen that have come down to earth. Complete nonsense, of course, but it, it does engage people. Um, it engages people in lots of different ways. So uh, archaeologically we know Wanjanas were produced at least 6,000 years ago based on radiocarbon dating uh, of the Wanjana. Usually the black in the eyes has carbon in them. Sometimes there's beeswax painted on, uh, placed on top of them or under them that can be dated. Um, and Wanjana are still being produced today. I myself have seen Wanjana produced last year in the Kimberley when I was doing field work up there. So it's part of a living tradition and an archaeological tradition. People today and people back in the archaeological past had strong links with Wanjana. Other people have links with Wanjana. In this slide over here, this is of the 2000 Sydney Olympics, uh, Donnie Wulaguja, a, a Wuroran man who is authorised to make copies of Wanjana, made this beautiful um, Wanjana uh, uh, artwork. And this Wanjana artwork was used to showcase Australianness. Um, obviously with an Aboriginal element, but um, with a nation-building element as well, to get everyone together and to unify under this very potent, powerful symbol. So really potent, powerful um, use that it was put to by a person who was authorised within the culture that made it to do that. Recently, in 2017, um, uh, an unauthorised but well-intentioned use came up. So here in the ABC News, you see the title, Art Exhibition in South Australia Shut Down Over Use of Kimberley Sacred Indigenous Figures. Um, there was an artist, very sympathetic to Aboriginal, um, all things Aboriginal, and inspired by Aboriginal art. And uh, the artist is a daubist, so that means they take things like Western landscapes and put, in this case, Wanjana figures in them. A lot of it is, is very trenchant critique of colonial violence, for example. So ideologically, um, sits very well with the Aboriginal world. However, this person, a non-Aboriginal person, was not authorised by, in this case, Wuroran speakers to use that Wanjana in that context. And there was a big outcry and the exhibition was closed. And there was quite a lot of upset, um, even though that wasn't intentioned. So this is just to show, A, the power of an, what we call an image, and B, how you use an image. So the, the largest image in here is from the, as you see, the Arts Law Centre of Australia. So a number of Auroran peoples, but not all, have decided to trademark and copyright the Wanjana to say that you cannot use Wanjana just as you cannot use a Nike swoosh symbol without permission. We want um, it used in the right way by the right people. So quite understandable, although interestingly even among Auroran people there's a difference of opinion with some Auroran people saying let anyone use it in any way they want, others saying ah but our Wanjana, we spell without the D, so this law doesn't apply to us. 
a fascinating, fascinating ethical conundrum that has good, bad, sad. It's just an interesting story. It's very instructive, though, to teach us that what we do and, and how we want to make our work known, how we want to make, in this case, um, the rock art of Aboriginal Australia known, um, comes with a number of ethical considerations and that unintentionally you can cause hurt. So that's why you've got to think through carefully the ethics laws and implications of any project, particularly digital projects where images are potentially accessed by a very wide range of people and information by a very wide range of people. You've just got to think those three carefully. Right now, let's get on to the first of the three case studies. So the monumental arch of Palmyra, much in the news of late. Let's go through the archaeological history of this, uh, its destruction, and then how um, digital solutions to its destruction were devised, as well as critiques of those solutions. So in Arabic, um, that's the name of the monumental arch of Palmyra, um, Palmyra in Syria, also sometimes known as the Arch of Septimus Severus. So we know it was built sometime in this period, 193 to 211 CE, CE, this common era, same thing as AD, probably we think um, to celebrate a victory by the Romans over the Parthians. So this was typical then in order, um, in a form of nationalistic nation building that favoured one nation and diminished another nation, you would build this triumphant arch, the victorious general army would come through the arch, people would celebrate this victory, and there you have it. So you can see over the years um, it, it fell into disuse, it wasn't really considered all that important, but then from the 1930s people started to pay attention and natural decay, which had caused a lot of it to fall down, was arrested by the, the first known restoration attempt in the 1930s. As a consequence of this restoration, tourists to Syria found this an interesting uh, monument to visit, so it became important to Syria, so important that in 1980 after years of motivation by the Syrian government and other stakeholders, it was listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site status, and it became very important to Syria's tourist economy and to their, their sense of a nation and to a sense of, of identity, for example. So this is the thing with heritage that, that can be very potent, it can be very positive, it can also be very negative. All good and well, lots of tourists visit this, architecturally interesting, interesting part of the world. Um, um, money is made for um, vendors around it, accommodation, tourism, all of those kinds of things. Then unfortunately in October of 2015, the arch was blown up. I mean, look at this spectacular violence visited on the arch and what's left over here, these freshly broken blocks and these were broken down then still further. So the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, otherwise known as ISIS, deliberately destroyed this when they, they occupied Palmyra. They destroyed this not just in terms of Islamic belief. Um, actually, it's really in terms of they, they know very, they're, they're very good strategists and they understand that the damage you can cause to a nation, to people, to the psyche, to a sense of identity is by damaging its heritage, by showing you have the power to damage and destroy its heritage, for example. If you recall, the Taliban did a similar thing to the Bamiyan Buddhas, for example. So over here, um, we have people then didn't sit back and say, oh, well, that's too bad. Uh, ISIS was, was defeated and uh, went out of Palmyra, for now anyway. We, we have to ask questions about, will such a thing happen in, at, in the future in Palmyra or elsewhere? What is the threat to heritage from war? Um, every day since the Second World War, there have been, um, having looked this up, no fewer than 11 major conflicts in the world going on and up to 30 different conflicts. So it has a definite impact on heritage. What are we going to do about it? So a number of decisions had to be made. Number one, you can leave it. Um, you can say it's too expensive to restore, it is not important enough to restore, the region is not stable, so we're not going to restore it for now. Through to things like, well, we can reconstruct it, and there are plans to block by block, put it back together, and then there are digital reconstructions. And so the images you're seeing here is one such digital reconstruction that happened. Um, using something um, these days as simple as 3D printing, this very portable arch that you see here on the left um, was constructed and in this case it was put up um, in Trafalgar Square and then carried on to a number of world capitals, for example. It was produced by basic 3D printing. Interestingly, a lot of tourist photographs people had taken on their iPhones and such like 
um, a call went out after the destruction encouraging people to share their photos on Flickr and, and other uh, digital platforms which were then harvested and used to reconstruct digitally the arch of Palmyra so that the 3D printing could take place. So there you have another picture here, people photographing the replica as, the, as a tourist attraction in its own right. So it raises a number of questions though, people say, well is this authentic? It's not obviously the actual arch, but it's a, a replica of part of it, and it's there to show one of the useful things the digital can do in the display of something. So not everyone can go to Syria, some people might be afraid of going there, some people might just not have the money or time to go there, and uh, this digital replica can travel around the world, it is scientifically exact in terms of lots of its detail, and people can benefit from having a look at it without going all the way um, to Palmyra. Whether you're convinced by it or not, people will have a look at it and say, mm, it's a bit too clean, you know, where is all the texture and the dirt and all of those kinds of things. So there are those kinds of things. There are critiques about, well, who's doing this? Is the Syrian government involved? Is this a case of the West colonizing by digital heritage other non-Western countries, for example? So there can be some quite deep critiques of it. Um, uh, and I'll show you something, uh, this article over here, uh, which is a very thoughtful article. The URL is provided. Do click on that and then you can see the whole article about the pros and cons, a very balanced article about, um, in the case of the Palmyra Arch, what is the good and bad of having a digital reconstruction. A very, very instructive short little two minute video about how this was done, the technology brought to bear, which we can have a look at for now. So click on that. Um, up comes the video. And it just has a lot of noise on it, so I might just voice over it slightly. Let's get it started. Here we go. So taking all of these photographs together, reconstructing what it looks like in 3D. Um, so we have all this pretty high-tech equipment, obviously done in stop motion and such like, but relatively quickly producing a 3D replica. Great stuff. So going back to the presentation. So the good parts over there is it's an interesting project. It stimulates creativity. It stimulates economy. You know, equipment like that costs quite a lot of money. It helps share a heritage with different parts of the world. It's quite engaging for students and for the public uh, from all walks of life. So there are a lot of, of, of good aspects to it. 3D printing happens to happen on sandstone. Obviously you'd say, well, that's not being done with traditional methods, so it can't be authentic in that way. But it's not intending to deceive you in any way. It's quite clear that this is a replica. It's a replica that has harvested a whole lot of digital sources and put them together in this product that you see over here. And look at the huge crowds it's gathering, the awareness of heritage that it generates is fantastic. So all of that's pretty great. But here I'll be the, the crabby academic and come in and say, you know, don't we just have to think a little while here and say, isn't it just a little bit ironic that all of this effort has gone in, all of this lamenting, blaming of ISIS, all of that kind of thing has gone in, when the original monument is itself a monument to violence. It's a monument to the victory of one group over another group through the death and destruction of people, places, all of those kinds of things. So a lot of people will say, oh, you're just being difficult. No, look, it's a good project. The thing that it did, you had a whole bunch of bad guys, you had an intervention, and you had a positive result kind of thing. We as academics are not here to make the world happy. We're not here to make um, people agree with us. If anything, we're here to make people equally unhappy, to look in a balanced way at a set of issues. My opinion in this is overall I think it's a good project um, and I think it's a good project because it raises issues like this but that issues like this do need to be raised. Which monuments do we validate? Are we going to put every monument up when the regime in um, 
Iraq was overthrown. Statues of Saddam Hussein, monuments, were pulled down, which most people saw as positive and have no plans to put those monuments up. Though there are some people who say they should be put up in order to irritate people and to remind them of repressive regimes so that doesn't happen again. So we have to think about monuments and what our technology is and isn't doing. So Palmyra is a great example for that rounded, balanced kind of thinking, as well as 101 sort of cool technical issues that are around it. Right, second case study, Beacon Virtua. So Beacon Virtua is a local product between the WA Museum, UWA and a number of other partners that I'll go over in a moment. Beacon Island is one of the islands in the Abrolhos. So here in this map of Australia, in the red area here, you have the Abrolhos group of islands. And this is Beacon Island here itself. Beacon Island is famous archaeologically because of um, the shipwreck survivors camp from the wreck of the Batavia. So the Batavia, and there's some slides on the, the, the images on the next slide as well, the Batavia sank near the island, a Dutch ship that sank in 1629. Um, sank there and uh, several hundred survivors then escaped to Beacon Island and some other islands as well. What happened then is, is a real pot boiler. It was a bestseller even in the 1600s in, in, in Holland. A group of people stayed on the island and another group of people went to, to help from Indonesia and eventually got help. But by the time they came back they found out that dozens of people had died and been murdered, and that a gang of you know murderous sailors, whoops, a murderous sailors, um, had set up a little regime on this and other islands, and set up courts and started killing and burying people, and a whole lot of evil kind of depredations. So it's significant in terms of Australia's colonial history, in that the earliest European colonial remains known in Australia are in fact murder victims, shipwreck survivor and murder victims. And our earliest known structure is the gallows that was set up on the island by this gang um, to execute people who challenged their, their rule, essentially. So it's not a pleasant history, but it's a fascinating history. Um, incidentally, the Dutch government, who are one of the partners in this project, are very supportive of this project. They say, we understand that this shows the Dutch in a bad light. But that was in the 1600s, and in any event, all cultures do things that are good, that are bad. This is an interesting story. It involves multiple partners. It involves all sorts of analysis. It involves the digital as well. So just going over the, the history of the island is, um, after, after these are period plates from the time, after the, the massacre and so forth, the island had occasional visits by mariners and those sorts of people. But it was really in the 1950s um, that fishermen built their shacks there between then and, and 2013. They started to find some human remains and in 1970 the WA Museum became involved um, and a mass grave was found in 1999 when UWA, the University of Western Australia, became involved. What was then realised that this site itself was an important archaeological site and cultural landscape and that the fishermen's shacks um, were impinging on that when you dig a shack in some cases it dug through the earlier archaeology. So in 2015 the shacks were demolished, but they weren't demolished without recording because the shacks are also part of the history of Beacon Island. Um, and so there had to be a number of decisions made as to how to capture that history and the archaeological history. There's a larger question here. When you look at this map, Western Australia is huge. It's a third of Australia. It has a very diverse heritage, going back 50, 60,000 years at least, continues into the present and covers all kinds of histories, good and bad. The geographic reach is, is enormous. Um, living in Perth, getting to the Kimberley for field work as I do each year is two and a half thousand kilometers journey one way. <laughs> so how do you manage such a heritage? How do you manage such a heritage so that everyone in the state, the two million plus people who live in the state, plus the, the country, Australia and the world have access to this fascinating history. And so this is um, where the virtual and the digital is really good at managing a vast, diverse and dispersed heritage. So just some more, um, more stuff. So just bear in mind those of you who have sensitivities about human remains, there are some images of, of the survivors' um, skeletons in the next slide. So just um, tune off for five minutes and I'll tell you when it's safe to have a look again. Those of you interested in human remains, next slide is going to be in three, two, one, and here we go. So 
You have to look at this as an archaeological process. Part of the site consists of the shipwreck. You can see it being excavated, very carefully labelled um, as a form of maritime archaeology. There's a suction dredge over there. And it had to be very carefully labelled because it was conserved and put together. And you can see the Batavia as it's put together here in the Maritime Museum in Fremantle. Um, some very careful decadal work, just work, amazing research that was done. So part of the site is underwater and part of the site is on Beacon Island that has all sorts of different structures. You can see here the sort of murderous um, lithograph that is made. There's the hulk, the wreck of the ship, the survivors, uh, the gallows, all the things that are happening. So those literary accounts were then ground truth or tested archaeologically and human remains were found, often in quite shallow burials. So this person over here, the arms are folded, looks as though they're buried in a, in a relatively calm way. This might have just been one of the survivors of the shipwreck who got ill or had injuries and was buried with some care. But the mass grave here, for example, shows people who were murdered. The, the forensic analysis done at the UWA Center for Forensic Anthropology is able to show marks of these violence and how these people were sort of thrown into a fairly shallow, expediently dug grave. Uh, so a very interesting story, a pretty hard story, but something that certainly captures the intention. It's a very useful story for showing how archaeology, forensics, historical and maritime work work. All right, moving away from the human remains, Beacon Virtue. So as the result of an Australian Research Council linkage grant called the Roaring Forties, together with the WA Museum's work and a number of other partners, which you see over here, um, Department of Environment, Planning, Natural and Historic Sites, Department of Fisheries, um, various individuals, uh, Curtin University, UWA, got together and said, right, the shacks are gone, we need to record those shacks plus the earlier history, and we need to allow people access to the island. The islands are far too go. Um, they're a protected reserve, so it's practically very difficult to get there physically, so let's do it virtually. Um, so the Beacon Island visualization came about. So in the short blurb, you can visit it on the WA Museum's website, it says in, in Beacon Virtue you can explore the legacy of the VOC, the Dutch East India Company, the Verenigde Oost-Indische Compagnie, um, Ship Batavia, by visiting a simulation, uh, excuse me, I'll just slow down, by visiting a simulation of Beacon Island. Beacon Virtue will take you on a tour of the island, including its jetties, fishing shacks, and several grave sites of Batavia voyagers who were buried on the island after the ship was wrecked and um, following the uprising. So it's very even-handed. What's nice about this is it's not saying the shipwreck survivors are more important than the fishermen's shacks. It's saying these are all part of the history of the island, and you can have a look at all of them. The graves have been reconstructed through a technique called photogrammetric 3D reconstruction, a digital technique, a process which uses multiple photographs of an object to build an accurate and detailed 3D model. These can be quite simple. For $80, you can buy Agisoft software, take a few photographs and get a 3D model. The resolution is not very good, and so you go up the scale in terms of how much software and computing power you need and how sp much specialist training you need in terms of getting that digital data together and manipulating it. So what we have here, I'm going to show you a short video clip and then we're going to take a tour through the virtue. So there's the short YouTube video, um, fairly low resolution, but quite nice and instructive. Um, you go onto the web page, there's the video, start him up, and let's have a listen. What that's saying in polite language is there are a lot of dirty weekends that were held on this island.
is showing how the grave was excavated, the mass grave, the bodies on top of each other. You can see some of the shacks were built over graves. in relation to the island where the Batavia Reef went down. This is a nice example of how an academic project has a, a, a public um, access point. So it says go to the, the full version over there, so let's do exactly that. Um, and I've called up earlier the full version so that it loaded. Uh, oh, recover the web page. So a lot of you will have seen um, virtual reality type projects. That they have drawbacks. Sometimes they're sort of clunky and difficult to access. I'm one of those people with sort of two left thumbs, and I'm not very good at accessing that. Um, and so you know that might be a problem. You would have seen in, in the, the video that you have a path, footprints that you follow. They've taken photographs, for example, of the fishing shacks, which no longer exist. Those have all been removed, and you can go in on those. Um, and then there are little snippets of information or breadcrumbs along the way. In this case, they haven't tried for a seamless integration. So those burials, for example, didn't have the landscape around those. They left those in, in, in quite... Um, uh, in just a very basic form so that you could see a little bit of the architecture behind it um, but it's a very useful teaching tool that people use um, and uh, as you can see here it was funded by an Australian Research Council project part of why the government funded it is they said we like research that both tells us new things about the past but that also then tells the public about those new things about the past a great deal of our money goes into um, informing the various publics we serve um, about the stuff we find out. Alrighty, so finally it's loaded, so obviously one of the limitations of the digital in this case is you've got to have the right software, you've got to have a fast internet connection, etc. So here the W, if I can find the W, makes you go forward and then you follow the breadcrumbs and you navigate um, with the footprints along here and you can access these little info things and then every now and again you get to, obviously I'm a sort of slow walker, looks like a bit under the influence here, but you then get to these information bubbles, walk along, and you can elect to go into one of the information bubbles, or you can hop between information bubble to other information bubble. Um, I'm still going along. I don't want to waste time on this. This is one of the things, because I'm not very good at it, this is one of the things that would be useful to have a look at at your own and see what you feel. I mean, one of the criticisms of VR very often is it has a quite hard texture. It doesn't actually look like um, built or natural structures. Uh, I quite like that, that it is consciously artificial, so you're not going to confuse it um, with the real product, if you will. But let's go back to those. So those are two... Um, uh, virtual usages that have taken digital data in the form of photographs, scans, um, excavation data, uh, legacy images like historic photographs and those sort of things and integrated them into a modern project. What are the issues here? So you need internet access, you need a computer, <coughs> and I'd add you need some skill there as well. Um, for all of these systems, they all work on particular kinds of software, none of which is going to last forever. So who upgrades that, for example, or if it needs to be archived, how does it get archived so that it can be accessed at some point in the future? Here you have multiple partners. This is a good and bad issue. So multiple partners means more people with whom you have to consult uh, and, and reach agreement on. In this case, for example, you have the Dutch government. Um, because they are human remains, and these were people who were working for the Dutch East India Company, they're Dutch citizens. Um, so Holland today says, um, when, when they were approached about repatriation of human remains, to say, well, these are Dutch citizens, even though it's 500 years ago, 400, and, uh, 400 years ago, 
just under 400 years ago, um, shouldn't they return to their birthplace, for example? Interestingly, isotope analysis of the bone shows that a number of the people are likely not to come from Holland, but that's another story. Should these people be repatriated to Europe? The Dutch government firmly says no, and they have a great way of putting it. They say, these are our ambassadors in Australia. They tell an interesting story. It's a hard story, but it's a very insightful story, and we are proud to support this project. So, so that's great. That's a very good outcome. Although immediately you have to think, how does this link to Indigenous Australia? Beacon Island, we don't know. It's original, Aboriginal name. It's likely to have had many names over the thousands of years. But these were Europeans without permission coming onto the land. Of course, they're shipwreck survivors. Um, but the whole notion of death and the display of human remains in many Aboriginal cultures is not considered appropriate. So how do you cater for that, for example? There's a particular issue that raises um, ethical and moral concerns, perhaps. Um, so um, interesting, again, like the Palmyra Arch. Finally, we get on to the antiquities trade. So antiquities, are just another word for artefacts or antiques, have been traded, bought, sold, swapped, displayed, etc. between people, between museums, between art galleries, uh, between companies, between all sorts of entities and collectors for many hundreds of years. The Romans collected, the Greeks collected, all sorts of people collected stuff from the past. Um, there are two different kinds of, of trade in antiquities. One is legal and one is illegal. Although you will, I will note here that just because something is legal doesn't necessarily make it moral or ethical and vice versa. And I'll go through this issue. It's a fascinating issue and it would be useful to have, this is a great issue to have, for example, a class debate on because there's so many things that are raised. Because there's no one answer, it varies throughout the world. Different countries manage their cultural heritage differently. For example, in the US, if it's not federal land, in many cases, the land and the archeology span on it is then owned by the property owner. And you are relatively free to dig that up it doesn't have to be an archaeological dig, you don't need a permit, and you can sell it, for example, on eBay, which we'll get onto in a minute. This is not true everywhere, but generally in the US. In the Anglophone world, British-derived world, generally the state is seen either as the owner or the guardian of cultural heritage. The state is there to look after a nation's cultural heritage on behalf of past, present and future generations and any intervention, including an archaeological excavation, requires a permit, requires a plan for where those artefacts are going to be housed, how they're going to be researched and all of those things. There's the portable antiquity scheme in the UK, for example. Some countries like South Africa say no, the state owns the country's cultural heritage and private citizens need to apply to the state for permission to impact that heritage, for example. Now and again, there's an attempt at internationalizing and standardizing this. UNESCO are the most famous here through the um, Convention on the Illicit Trade in Antiquities. More on that in the next slide. So it's already a contested space. It's already a space with a lot of uncertainties, illegalities, uncertainties, and the digital age just makes it more so. So one of the things the digital age does is national boundaries are now easy to transgress over things like the internet, over things like international postage and those kinds of things. Um, many people love having antiques in their house. State of Israel, for example, regularly sells off antiques um, artifacts because it has so many of them. Not an infinite number, but that's a decision they've made, which has attracted both praise and criticism. You know, many people like to have a house in which there are they appreciate and, and look after, in, in, in some ways sometimes museums can't afford to, look after objects for their enjoyment. Auction houses, Christie's, Sotheby's, other auction houses regularly convey on behalf of a client um, antiquities for people. Um, there are varying levels of proving provenance, and this is one of the issues, but there's a huge trade out there, it happens every day and it's worth several billion dollars each year. We also have the illegal side of things. So here, for example, you have websites showing where hotspots are for looting. Typically, these hotspots will be in underdeveloped countries, but the markets for the sale of them and where um, the operators are operating out of will tend to be so-called first world countries. Um, UNESCO has the Convention for the Fight Against the Illicit Trafficking in Cultural Property. Even UNESCO says there will be trade in cultural property. That's normal and that's okay. Um, if it's regulated, but there's a lot of illegal trade that leads to the destruction and looting of, in this case, museums, 
And this photograph is an aerial shot of an archaeological site. And all of these holes are holes that looters have made to find pretty artifacts to sell into this antiquities trade. So the person looting over here, um, in many cases they will be uh, committing a crime, but they only get a small amount of money. And then as the artifact is sold on through the various um, middle people in the trade through to the final um, buyer, um, the price then tends to go up. But what is happening here is the archaeological context and the fabric of the site itself is being destroyed. As archaeologists, all artifacts are of equal value to us. We do not put a price value on them, but they tell us different things about the human past. But their ability to tell us those things lies in where that artifact is situated physically in relation to other artifacts in the site, what the soil profiles are telling us, all of those things. So the illegal trade in antiquities is a massive problem. Increasingly it has been used as a, as a front for money laundering, for illegal activities and even terrorism. So it's a very serious issue and one that any archaeologist or heritage specialist gets involved in at some point um, to try and counter. All right, on to eBay. So on eBay, there are others, but this is just a very well-known one, you can find all sorts of things for sale, artifacts for sale. Off the Australian eBay, you have for $1,800, 11 people are watching this, pay some postage, an old stone carving of a Wanjana from the Kimberley. Um, this is from the US eBay, and I'll go to those websites in a minute. A rare Islamic artifact, a Muhammad Prophet letter, King of Bahrain, authentic, etc., 1.2 million dollars hmm? um, through to half a million dollars for Chinese jade artifacts, uh, Mayan stone monkey, 195,000 dollars, etc. Let's have a look at this. Let's go to the, the US eBay. Um, I did actually call it up earlier. Um, uh, which one? Uh, yeah. Yep, US. So usually over here you type in something like artifact using the US type of spelling. Put in artifact. I then usually like to go and sort it by the highest price first. So here you go, so here's, uh, for some reason there's a telescope there. So here is this 1.2 million year old artifact. So let's have a look at that. That's a hell of a lot of money, or best offer. Um, so pre-owned, <laughs> really? So clicking on that, what's important here is you, you, you have to, if you're gonna put out $1.2 million, you want to know that this artifact is authentic and that you want to know that the seller has the right to sell this, and that you don't, for example, need import and export permits in order to, if you're in another country. Um, so what information do they provide? So here they provide a whole lot of information. Now, this is very much caveat emptor, buyer beware. Just because something appears on the internet doesn't mean that it's true. Even someone like eBay, though they have some measure of oversight, they say, well, our buyers put things on there, we have a complaints procedure, but we ourselves do not really look at this content, we accept it to be true and that people are not lying to us. But in the illegal antiquities trade, a lot of it operates by lying. So here they give you a whole lot of um, information. They say it is 100% confirmed authentic and taken to a laboratory in London to confirm its uh, authenticity. Immediately I go, oh, a laboratory in London, that's very non-specific. If they'd said University College London and Professor so-and-so looked at it and provided a certificate of authenticity. They say the rare artifact is currently stored in the Yale Archives building at Yale University. Well, why would Yale allow this to be stored in their archives? And um, how does this person have the right to sell it? So immediately it sounds... To me, pretty fishy. I do not know if this is genuine or not. I'm looking at a photograph and some text. I'm not looking at the actual artifact. So they give you a whole lot of stuff over here, but there's nowhere here you can actually follow this up. So it's a bit, it's a bit tricky. Um, please always feel free to contact us with any questions. Uh, I did actually send a query to question um, what I've just told you. Uh, that was done about a week ago and I've received no reply. Um, Delivery options by the owner to anywhere in the US by private jet can be arranged. Enjoy. I'm not sure that that is enough information for putting $1.2 million out there. It seems to me tricky. They don't mention any heritage legislation at all. So how do we know it's not looted, that it wasn't stolen um, um, from somewhere in Arabia, for example, from Bahrain, perhaps? Uh, how do we know we're receiving we're not receiving stolen goods. So beware of things like that. 
Um, let's go to the other end of the scale and have a look at the cheapest artifacts. So uh, view, sorry, view by, no, uh, view by price lowest first. So you can get, oh, these are very different sort of artifacts. You very often have things like chert or flint tools. Let's go somewhere in the middle. Uh, no, still not. Let's just qualify that search a little bit. Put artifact. In this case, I happen to know that there are a lot of stone artifacts. Oh, and if we spell it correctly, that are usually for sale. So there you go. Stone tools, 99 cents. Native American bird stone, authentic artifact. So again, if you, so here you have something approaching an, um, an accession number. Um, let's have a look what they say about it. What information do they give about it? Can you check up on the seller? Uh, nice collector. Da, 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 da. So they don't really tell you anything about the provenance, where it came about. So already we're not particularly um, um, impressed by what's going on here. And we just don't really know who these people are. You know, Vilki Antiques, Mm, they seem to have had good ratings. Here are some of the other things they've sold. So A, you don't know whether this is authentic, and there's no documentation supplied. Um, you have to ask for it to see if this is in fact authentic. Moving over to the Australian site, let's have a look at um, Kimberley Artifact. Start it slightly differently. This is just the Kimberley where I happen to do research. And here you can find things like a carved boab nut, a glass fish fishing um, point, so Aboriginal people were, took European glass and made points out of it. So here you can have a look. It's very finely made. The questions we have to ask, is it made by an Aboriginal person? Or is there a workshop where someone is employing people to make Aboriginal looking artifacts? Who is this person? Um, they give us um, condition, various conditions. Where did they find it? There's a lot about postage terms and conditions. Um, they say it's in an authentic vintage condition, traces of reddish brown material in the serrations of the blade, gorgeous finely worked museum quality Kimberley um, fishing spear point. But again, I don't really know much about this, where, much about the point itself or the, the seller's authority to in fact sell it. So those are just some examples. Go onto eBay yourself and have a look and see what's for sale and what's not for sale. Again, a Wanjana like, actually, let's look for that Wanjana like, Aboriginal old stone carving Wanjana. Um, let's go have a look for that Wanjana. I know we want to continue recording. Um, where was I? eBay. Is it that one? Uh, let's look up Wanjana. So there are likely all sorts of things. Oh, there it is. So a number of people are watching this. There's another one over there. read through that. I cannot age this piece but I know it has been an old collection for 40 years in this weathered condition. Picked method. So as a rock art specialist I say to me that looks relatively unlikely though there were um, examples of portable art. The degree of patination it actually looks fairly recent in, 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 to me um, but we just don't have enough information really to say. Um, you'll notice that below this one on the eBay site us back, take us back again. This one over here, whoa, take us forward. This one over here, Aboriginal rock painting. As a rock art specialist, I can tell you now that that is not an original rock painting, though it might have been done as an ab by an Aboriginal person um, for sale in the modern art market. So you do have to be careful, you have to get a specialist involved, you have to ask who's profiting, um, is anyone being harmed by here. So the issues over here, the issues are just so very numerous. Um, we've done useful things, we heritage specialists, by showing where the main markets are. So that's where we need to educate people properly about the sale of these artifacts, about the damage that it, just, uh, that it, it does, both to people's sense of identity and physically to archaeological sites. It's very, very difficult to police. It's a billion dollar industry, so it's not going away anyway soon. So we have to think, how do we creatively but effectively manage um, this trade? So that's it for Digital Heritage Futures, a uh, really fascinating field, um, one that is changing literally every day. So it's a great thing to get involved with. 
either from the research side or from the public side. In practice, they're a process that feed into each other. It's very powerful. If we do it correctly, digital archaeology can be democratic. It can allow the, the universe, as long as they have an internet connection, etc., access um, to some of the world's treasures. Um, so, nice thing to do. Whole different set of skills in, in archaeology. Um, so, go out there, have a look, play around on the internet and other places, and develop some digital skills. You'll be in demand if you have them. Thanks very much.